So just to review, the um, <clears throat> neocortex, which is different than um, some areas of older cortex, uh, like paleocortical or archicortical regions, including the hippocampus, you know, which is in the medial temporal lobe, uh, parts of the insular lobe, these areas are actually um, much older in an evolutionary sense, and they tend to be more uh, distinct in terms of their kind of cortical organization. They tend to have fewer layers, for example, than neocortex. But neocortex, which is the bulk of what you see when you look at the lateral surface of the brain or the, you know, the, the dorsal surface of the brain, the ventral surface of the brain, uh, neocortex is a six-layered structure. So again, you're going in, you know, from the outside and you're going to encounter, as you go down in a vertical direction, six, you know, horizontal layers, starting with layer one, then layer two, then layer three, then layer four, layer five, six, and then below that, you're going to get to the white matter cabling that connects, you know, different areas of the brain. Um, now, the horizontal organization, again, is primarily based upon the pattern of inputs. That means axons coming in from subcortical structures or from other areas of neocortex and outputs. That means, you know, uh, neurons within the cortical layers, you know, sending projections out to um, you know, other areas of neocortex or you know, sending those projections back down or to you know, various subcortical structures. So um, the uh, layer four, for example, is defined by the fact that it's you know, four layers in, but it also is the primary input layer. That's where most of the projections that are coming from you know, other areas of neocortex or from subcortical structures are going to arrive and form synaptic connections. So layer four, just remember, is always input. So to any area of neocortex, when something's coming in, again, whether it's from the lateral geniculate nucleus in the thalamus heading to primary visual cortex and arriving into that region of primary visual cortex, well, it's gonna arrive in and make synaptic connections with cells in layer four. Um, we also have, you know, or it could be another area of neocortex projecting into that area those axons that come into that area of cortex are also going to make synaptic connection with cells in layer four. Layers two and three, or the more superficial layers towards the surface, right? Those neurons are actually going to send their projections sort of down into the white matter, and then they're going to go out to some other area of neocortex where they're going to you know, make synaptic connection. Again, it's now going to be an input coming in right to this area, so it'll make connection in layer four. Um, the deeper um, sort of layers, horizontal layers of neocortex, layers five and six, project out down to something subcortical typically, like back to the lateral geniculate nucleus or to the basal ganglia or to some kind of brainstem you know, nucleus or to the, the amygdala or the nucleus accumbens. So that's the horizontal organization of neocortex. You also have a vertical organization. That means that the cells you know, that are in the various horizontal layers actually form synaptic connections with each other across those la layers. They form them in these sort of columnar forms. So there's like this, these sort of regular columns. If you're looking down at the surface of neocortex, you're looking down at layer one, but you should imagine all those cells below, you know, are all interconnected in this, these sort of neighboring columns, right? So everything, things get sort of shared where the input layer comes in, but then the information is sort of discreetly processed in separate columns. And what's also quite interesting about this organization is um, that these individual structural columns have very specific functional significance. So it was determined, um, you know, a long time ago now, back in the 70s, that if you present like a bar of light in a very specific part of the visual field out here in front, right? and you're recording from a column, you know, on the other side in primary visual cortex, that column will respond to a bar of light oriented in a very specific direction. It's got to go up and down like this, for example, right? And it's got to be in this very specific location to get this entire column of cells to respond to it, right? They'll, it'll fire as long as you present that very specific visual stimulus in this specific location. If you tilt that bar of light just a touch, that column will stop. But the neighboring column will now start to fire. You tilt it again, you know, that column will stop. And then another neighboring column will fire. And you can find this, the, the, with visual experience, the routing of visual information, you know, from the visual world, you know, through the retina, you know, back to the lateral geniculate nucleus, and then back to, you know, the cortical columns. Those columns become 
functionally organized based upon very simple you know, aspects of the visual input in the case of, of vision. If you go to primary auditory cortex, it turns out that you know, one column in primary auditory cortex, which remember is in the temporal lobe, will respond to a, a particular frequency of sound. And then the neighboring column will go with a slightly higher frequency. And then the neighboring column is a slightly higher frequency. So you're developing this kind of mapping of frequency, which they will, will learn is called tonotopy. But again, this requires, you know, experience with you know, the auditory environment with, 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 you know, sound actually during certain critical developmental periods, because the wiring from here, you know, through, we're going to see a series of brainstem connections to the medial geniculate nucleus in the thalamus, and then to, you know, primary auditory cortex, or what we call A1, that's going to organize those structural columns in a functional way. And what I want to make the point here is that Early in primary visual cortex, primary auditory cortex, primary somatosensory cortex, the, the, the columns, individual columns become organized functionally. They respond to specific attributes of either, you know, the visual input or the auditory input or the somatosensory input. But these are very simple properties. But then you get projections out to other areas of neocortex. So layers two and three in primary auditory, sorry, primary visual cortex you know, projects into area V2 or area V3 or area V4. It comes in, of course, at the input layer, which is always layer four. Um, but uh, uh, what you start getting are columns that are now functionally organized by more complicated aspects of the visual, you know, scene. And in fact, as you continue to sort of move forward, you know, the inputs that are coming into these regions of neocortex are not just visual inputs. They may also be auditory inputs, or they may also be somatosensory inputs. They may also be, you know, inputs from areas that are involved in sort of memory or, or decision making, you know, other sorts of um, inputs. Um, so um, the, the uh, functional uh, stimuli, the stimuli that'll functionally drive columns as you go further, further into the brain, you know, as you move in an anterior direction, become significantly more complex. They also become, um, it, it, your, the system's designed so that, um, your system is designed so that it doesn't have to be like a stimulus presented just in this one location anymore. It could be a complex stimulus in a much you know, broader part of the visual field. So for example, as you go into the temporal lobe, remember you have areas that are important for recognizing different classes of complex object. So like faces, for example, all the way at the anterior pole of the temporal lobe, the columns there are literally organized to functionally respond to, you know, the face of individuals, of different individuals, whether they are actually oriented this way, this way, or whether they're anywhere in um, the visual field. So, so um, this is, you know, what's interesting is that these, um, Columns are structural features. They're vertical columns, you know, cells interconnected across those six layers of neocortex. Uh, but that they develop a functional role. And what's we it's relatively easy to figure out like what are the simple stimuli in primary sensory areas that functionally organize these columns. But as you move forward in the brain, the stimuli become more complicated. And when you get to areas of the frontal lobe, for example, there's like a lot of stuff that we really don't know. You know, what is it that is driving this column's activity versus that? There's some tantalizing evidence that, for example, um, this, the, uh, the sort of power dynamics or the, the, uh, the emotional tenor of, an intera of a complex social interaction might drive you know, column behavior in some of these more anterior frontal regions, but it's definitely something much more complex, you know, than a bar of light in a particular orientation, which is where a lot of that visual input, you know, kind of gets built up from, right? Okay, cheers.